Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 627 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's episode of the Juice Box Podcast is another in the After Dark series. This one was actually slated for next month, but I'm moving it up for one special listener. If you know who you are and you're listening, I believe in you. I think you can do it. And I hope this episode helps you. Please remember while you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juice Box Podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. On today's show, we're going to be speaking with Casey. He has had diabetes for a very long time and disordered eating since he was a child. Casey's tried a number of things to help himself, and one thing stuck. So much so that when he came on the podcast, he wanted to bring the person with him who helped him get through it. This is going to be broken up a little bit. We'll be talking to Casey in the beginning, and then Shira will join us and talk about how she helped Casey. I hope you hang around. This is a good one. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter. Go to contournext.com forward slash juice box to learn all about my daughter's blood sugar meter. Later in the episode, I'll tell you more about it. But for now, here's what you should know. It's little, but not too little. It's amazing. Can you be too amazing? It fits in your pocket or your bag. It has a super bright light. It's the most accurate meter I've ever used. And you can learn more about it and get started at contournext.com forward slash juice box. Hi, uh, my name's Casey. Casey, how long have you had type one? Uh, it's going on, I guess, 43 years now. Wow. 44. 44. 44 years? How old were you when you were diagnosed? I was nine. Wow. Nine years old. I'm making my so 1970, 1978. That'll, that'll date me perfectly. We're almost the same age. I think so. That's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, I was born in 71. So, so it was only a couple years before blood testing. <laughs> Real, really? Yeah. yeah. How, how, what, what, did, what do you remember them doing for you? Oh, well, I mean, back in those days, uh, there was no blood testing at home. Um, there were no A1Cs, in fact. Um, we tested urine in a test tube. Um, and only in, and very shortly thereafter, they came out with urine test strips kind of that, that look a lot like the blood testing strips did. Right. Um, you know, my family discovered you could slice them down the middle and double your double, get the double twice as many for your money. Um, <laughs> Did they, I don't know why I found that amusing. Uh, just the, I'm, I'm picturing somebody with a pair of scissors going, now we're saving. That is exactly what I did. Yeah. Oh, that is exactly what I did. Sometimes you'd miss and, and screw up the strip, but you know, uh, it still, still saved a chunk of money. No kidding. That's really crazy. Yeah. And did you find them to be fairly inaccurate or would you have no way to know? Um, there's no way to know. No, I, I think you had to, tr it was the only mechanism available. Um, in fact, this, so this will get sort of towards the, the heart of my story. By the second year of my diabetes, I learned that you could fake out the, the test tube strip, the test tube testing, uh, by testing with water and get a, basically an orange result meant you had a high blood sugar, mm -hmm. but two hours ago, um, Unlike blood testing, which tells you where you are within a few minutes, right. um, the urine testing was two hours in the past. Um, but if you, I learned that I could fake it, and um, and I did for a year straight. Um, it looked it looked like I was in a, hun a second honeymoon um, as I as I faked my my urine testing. How, this, how is do you this is this is probably my second year, second maybe third year of diabetes. And, um, you're 11 years old. You're a little chemist. And what did you do? Just did you dilute the urine? Well, I, I, if somebody were watching, I'd do the real thing. Um, if nobody was watching, then I would uh, fake it with just just water. And what? Uh, and what are brought and back? A blue, res, a blue result meant uh, my blood sugar was healthy. Oh, I see. So the thing gets wet, 
and then it either measures there's glucose or there isn't. It doesn't measure if there's urine or there isn't. That's right. Oh, that's right. It, it rea- would react to any liquid. Um, I didn't. I don't remember experimenting with other other liquids, but um, um, it was just a it was a tablet that you dropped into the test tube, and then you'd add a a couple drops of urine or in, in my case water, and um, and you get the test result. Do you remember what led you to want to make it look normal? Um, basically cheating on my diet. Um, you know, back then it was, it it was only after I went to summer camp for kids with diabetes that I learned how to eat things like not candy, but, uh, ice cream or potato chips or, um, or things like that. My training at the hospital when I got diagnosed was really pretty rigorous. I learned a lot about food content that I still remember today. Um, but there were uh, acceptable foods and unacceptable foods, and there were free foods. Um, and free foods I lived for, Fresca, Carefree Gum, um, Pickles, uh, Jello. You know, those, those, there's a, a short list of, of free foods. But yeah. um, there were lots of foods that were for, forbidden, essentially. Um, and so if I caved in and had those things, um, then I, we even back in those days, it was essentially one shot and done. So I had a one shot of long acting insulin in the in the morning. Um, I didn't I didn't take regular at that point in my life um, or fast acting insulin at that point in my life. And um, and so there was no way to correct uh, hmm. for, for overeating. And um, and so I would just fake it. I'd, I'd, I'd hide it. And so, so this was just a, a function of for your parents. So your parents would think that your blood sugar was okay. Right, right. What would happen if they thought it was high? They started paying well, more attention to what um, you were we eating. Didn't, we, it, it was it would be stressful because I'd have to. I I would either lie or not. I'd fess up, um, or uh, we'd have a long discussion about what was you know what I'd done. I kind of think it was. It was. I was embarrassed and ashamed mm-hmm. and things like that. So. I mean, I, 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 that's that's pretty. I, I say that lightly, but the embarrassment and shame were an ever, an ever present feeling. Okay. You know, from my from the early days of even before diabetes, I had issues with food. I was a a bit overweight prior to diabetes. Uh, when I was about eight, second second third grade, um, I, I I would at the on the way home from school, I would buy candy, um, and this is before diabetes. So um, I gained a lot of weight in that year eight and nine. Um, and it was comfort food, basically. And I had, I had some troubles with a teacher. I had troubles with a, a, a fellow classmate. Um, and I found food a comfort. Soothing, yeah. Um, but it also made me feel ashamed, even then, even before diabetes. Um, when I got diabetes, I actually thought I was, I thought it was my fault. You know, even though they told me otherwise, I didn't believe them. I I thought this was God's punishment for, you know, sneaking the candy, stealing stealing money from my father's dresser to buy candy after school. You know, that kind of thing. I I was actually thinking about the the incongruence between you cutting the test strips in half to save the money and then wasting the test strip by just running it under the water. Like, th- did that must have even gotten to you? I imagine. Did you think about that? Or is that a well, little past your age, maybe? Except the cutting of the strips, I think, was probably driven by my parents. Um, so you weren't worried about the cost; they were. Well, yeah, I, yeah. that's right. That's right. I, I mean, just... I, I I adopted that, but um, I think that the wasting of the test uh, reagent was probably to to protect my ego, because um, it was such a shameful thing that I I cheated. You know, like, yeah. I, mean, I was a bad a bad diabetic. In the, this is in the seventies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, do you think something about your, well, you're, you're on today to talk about a, a, an eating disorder. That's right. Right. That's right. So, so do you, have you ever thought back on it? Do you think the diabetes kicked it into gear or do you think you would have found your way to it without diabetes? <laughs> yes and no, uh, or yes to both questions. Okay. Um, Yes, I think I was probably susceptible it, susceptible to it uh, from an early age, um, as and that's sort of why I talked about what was going on when I was eight. Right. Um, 
But I think that diabetes, with its focus on numbers, um, leads right, and, and its focus on diet and restriction. Um, and I, I know that nowadays we we tend not to think about it as restrictions anymore. But I still think that some of us are getting trained with these moralistic attitudes about it. And I think that's dangerous because I think it, it, it helps feed the beast. If it helps feed eating disorders. Yeah. Um, um, Moralistic. So yeah, you, I think uh, you're talking about like plain and simple black and white. I did it right. I did it wrong. That, that feeling that it leaves you with. That's right. Okay. Right. I mean, you're in, in, in those days, it was, if you had an orange, um, you, you were wrong. You were bad diabetic. Um, you know, now it would be something if you're over, over 180, you know, that, that's, that could be conceived as bad, but you know, it's not a moral question. It's a, you know, it's a navigation question. So when you have that, if a person has that feeling and today real time and they're led to think, oh, there's probably a management way I can deal with this better. That probably leads to some sort of an outcome, hopefully, that's that's viable, that works. But if the thought ends up being, oh, I just shouldn't eat that anymore, is that the beginning of the end? Like, is that feeling what drives you in that direction? Like, I can't I don't eat think this? it's as simple as that. I no? think, you know, I guess I would tell you that, you know, for most of my growing up and, and probably – in my 20s and 30s, I had disordered eating, uh, okay. eating where I overate and ate quite a lot um, and then wouldn't take all of the insulin necessary to uh, handle that, to get my blood sugar back in line. I would let it ride and basically um, piss it away. Yeah. Um, you know, and run, run the perpetually running the, or frequently running the risk of long-term uh, complications to stave off the impact of the food of the overeating. So it, to, it, it, yes. And to control weight. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was obsessed with gaining weight or not gaining weight or preventing the gain of weight, uh, even though I couldn't control my eating mm -hmm. and, um, and I would manipulate my insulin to, to control that later in my forties, I developed a, a thyroid condition and, um, at the same time in my life, I was getting divorced. Uh, because of the divorce, I was losing the house or having to short sell the house we had. Um, and I was engaged in this this pretty severe disordered eating. Um, so binge binge eating. Yeah. And for a time, I, I stopped taking insulin. Or for long stretches, I would not take insulin. I would take enough insulin to keep me out of the hospital, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so in my 40s, it reached the worst point. So, I mean, we tend to think of eating disorders as something that, as something that affects uh, young women, teenage girls. Um, but honestly, it can affect anyone at any time in their life. Wow. Um, just if the, if the timing is wrong, um, I think it can, it, can blow, it can blow up into a full-blown illness. Um, so I would say, you know, my behaviors – as a teenager and, and through, through college in my work life, um, the disordered eating was a problem. Um, it became, I became really very sick in my forties okay. and, uh, and it would hijack my metabolism in other ways. So not just manipulating insulin, but I would manipulate the thyroid medication to become hyper thyroid to lose, to weight. lose weight fast, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, well, can I ask you, uh, I mean, it seems kind of an obvious question, but is that process that takes over your life? Is it like a job? It becomes a job. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it becomes, it becomes a, a, a job to hide it from everyone too. Um, so if I hide it from your work, your coworkers, your, your boss, your, uh, your loved ones, um, your friends, it, uh, it's pretty all in cup. It becomes all encompassing. So you and, and but it's very conscious, though, it sounds like for you, it was like it wasn't you were well aware you were doing it. Meaning it was on yes. purpose. Yes. So is it, it to try to help me understand a little bit? Am I standing in the kitchen with food in my hand and thinking I'm going to eat too much food and then I'm not going to take insulin and then I'll lie to this person? Like, does it all run through your head like that? Or is it just happening 
do you know what I mean? Like, like is it, what's the word I'm looking for? Is it, it's, a, it's not, it's not so malice of forethought. Okay. It's, uh, it's more, it just unfolds. Because each time it happens, you promise yourself you're not going it, to. It's like other addiction, mm-hmm. uh, you know, alcohol or drugs or cigarettes, or uh, you tell yourself you're not going to do it again. Um, that you know, as guilty as you feel, as ashamed you might feel, um, this had to. This this is definitely the last time. And, right. and it just uh, honestly, again. you would cave every time. Yeah. Or I, you know, I caved every time. Are you even? Um, are you even aware of the soothing part at that point? Like the eating is the eating still masking something for you, like a an emotional pain, or what? What was it doing? Well, here's the thing. I think um, you know what I've discovered in recovery is that by managing my diabetes closely, keeping it um, in range, um, minimizes the urge to overeat uh, a lot. It doesn't eliminate entirely. So, mm-hmm. you know, I still have to find better ways to cope with intense emotions, anxiety, stress. Um, uh, what else was I thinking? Shame. Uh, if I feel those things, um, then they're likely to trigger a desire to, to binge okay. uh, as comfort. Okay. Um, but that's, that's even less now, too. I mean, it, it happens from time to time. Uh, I've been, but I've, I've been in recovery enough that I found other strategies that are effective. But the biggest thing for me uh, is that when I'm, when my blood sugar is low, I want to eat the whole damn kitchen. Mm-hmm. Uh, if my blood sugar is high, I want to eat the whole damn kitchen. And if I keep it within range, I don't have that, that it's a, I don't have the physical drive uh, to, to binge. So it's, it's, it becomes, I think the urge to binge starts from a, a, a physical uh, physical thing. So uh, dieters put their bodies in in crisis, and in, in, they put themselves in an energy deficit, mm-hmm. and so they're vulnerable um, to that to, feeling, to this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it's- likewise, folks who are focused on appearance or their body. So uh, athletes like runners and wrestlers, models, singers, um, dancers, gymnasts, yeah. all have a much higher incidence of of eating disorder uh and it's because they're they're focused on on their appearance they're, they're worried of, they're they're worried about how they look and or how much they weigh wow. um so there's a physical piece and a and a psychological piece that's absolutely right and yeah, so i mean yeah. for me the biggest chunk uh of getting getting into recovery i, I talk about getting straight um was first getting a handle on the physical uh physical symptoms right um, and I lucked out in that respect. I, I lucked out in a sense. I, um, the, my forties, I became so ill, um, that I was severely dehydrated, uh, really weak. Uh, I could barely function. Um, and I'm a, uh, I'm an engineer by day, but I'm a musician by night and I sing. And so I was in New York, uh, New York city, um, singing on stage or you know, planning to sing on stage. Um, but I had a foot infection uh, for about a week, maybe maybe actually longer than that. It was a, a, a few weeks, um, but it had been bothering me the whole week that I was in New York. Um, and I knew that I had to get seen. Um, I went up on stage to sing a couple songs uh, and was so weak from dehydration. So you can imagine the dehydration results from uh, high blood sugars. Okay. Uh, and perpetually high blood sugars. I was constant. I was constantly uh, dehydrated, um, but I was so weak I could barely hold. I, could, I had to hold myself up using the microphone stand, and um, and I finished. I finished my my piece. Walked off the stage, um, said goodbye to my friends there, and jumped in a cab and went to went to the hospital. So um, when I got to the hospital. Uh, it was clear I had to have part of my foot removed. Uh, oh, really? And that was that was that for me was the uh, the straw that broke the camel's back. Well, it was it was the uh, wake up call. Yeah, was, uh, yeah. So, would you, or even in that scenario, are you <clears throat> eating because of the stress of the performance, but restricting insulin because of the stress of people looking at you during the performance? 
Yeah, basically. That's yeah, it. that's right. That's that's pretty pretty that's pretty. To- uh, Okay, see, that sounds yeah. torturous. It really was torturous. Yeah, yeah, yeah it really was. It's 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 quite literally the the <laughs> it's the it's the basis for every Marvel movie, right? Like it's it's like you know you want something, the thing kills you. Um, you know you can't stop yourself from wanting it. You can't stop yourself from going after it. It tries to kill you. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, that's insane. Um. And it's it's hard to imagine if you're not going through it. I would think. I would think people listening who don't have this in their life. I str- I struggle to really put myself back in that those feelings because uh, um, I even describing it to you today. I mean, I'm I'm a, I'm at a distance from it, mm-hmm. and um, and it, you're right. It isn't. It was insane. It is insane. And um, I I now struggle to sort of empathize with my old self it's sort of like how how is that possible how could how could you how could you have done that do you have um, moments when you're mad at yourself in retrospect yeah oh because oh i have i've because of i i guess i was going to talk when we talked about the long-term consequences of of eating disorders like like diabulimia this is this is eddmt1 eating disorder di- diabetes mellitus type one mm-hmm. um but I think of it as diabulimia in my case because it was basically binge eating followed by restriction of insulin. Those two things were pretty fundamental to what I was doing. Right. And um, but the long term consequences are just what you'd expect. The obvious ones are you know eye damage, kidney damage, uh, circulation issues, uh, neuropathy. Um, the less visible things are things like mm, gastroparesis, so so problems with digestion. Um, skin problems, teeth problems, periodontal disease. I actually have some pretty severe damage to my, to my gums and teeth um, that I can't, I can, I can slow down, but you know, I've lost a lot of bone. Right. Um, And you can, um, it interferes with your sex life. So um, it, uh, the neuropathy can uh, really cause a problem for men, especially um, the ED of ED. So to speak. How much beyond of, that? There, but, the, the less visible consequences are what happens to your relationships with people. So problems with work, um, problems with your love life, problems with you know being un, unavailable to your kids, so missing important things in your kids' lives. Mm-hmm. Um, you know all those things. I think we don't tend to think about those things. But for me, diabulimia whittled away everything I had. So I lost love. I lost a home. Uh, I lost work, um, you know. So I ended up, I ended up with absolutely nothing. Yeah, I you kept going, and I I tr- I almost cut you off to ask if you thought this had something to do with the, the dissolving of your marriage, but I think you answered that pretty well. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But it, but it wasn't. I mean, it's every I probably burned through every love I ever had. Okay. Uh, because of this, like over the over the years, you know. What's the mechanism there that you're just not ever authentically being yourself, and so the person knows a version of you that's not really you? That, um, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, that you could, I I certainly tried to be upfront and honest, uh, and even later, more recently, uh, I knew I I was in half-assed recovery where i i thought uh i thought i was recovering and i confessed to my uh, my girlfriend at the time um that i had an eating disorder she didn't really understand it um didn't ask many questions didn't really pursue it um i tried to explain as best i could but uh, i think i'm not i'm not quite sure why she didn't mm-hmm. um certainly she loved me but um I, the the problem was that because I was still engaging in in some of the behaviors, uh, this was after the foot, you know, after I lost uh, a toe. Um, it took a long time. It took three years to finally get physically uh, back to I'd say not normal, but uh, to 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 be recovered and. Um, it took a while to get the shoe wear correct, um, so I wouldn't re-injure myself, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, 
but I still was periodically engaging in overeating and, and manipulation of insulin, not to the same degree, but I still was doing it. Yeah. And, um, Unfortunately, it causes all kinds of things physically. So water retention issues. Sometimes it'd be. Sometimes I'd feel bloated. Sometimes I feel dehydrated. Uh, energy problems. Um, stamina problems. Uh, as I said, uh, sexual dysfunction. Um, so in a relation, in an intimate relationship, those things are are devastating. Right. And as a man with a woman, I could try to explain but more often than not they blame themselves they thought it was them they thought they they were unattractive or they thought um you know there was there was something wrong with the relationship that kind of thing so yeah um, so that thing that, happens to you and then it triggers something in them about how they feel and then you're on a slippery slope of people's feelings <laughs> that's uh, absolutely right yeah, right yeah wow um a couple of small questions the, the loss of the toe, and you said about footwear that fits. So your health was so tenuous that even just pressure from an ill-fitting shoe caused you an issue? or Well, it, it, the trick was, you know, I lost my baby toe, which if you're going to lose something, um, that's probably not a bad thing. Okay. Um, you lose a big toe, it screws up your balance in profound ways, uh, right. that kind of thing. Um for me, what it meant was there was a bone. There's a the, the metatarsal bone in my in my left foot floats because mm -hmm. it's it's not tied to a toe, and um, and that means that left to its own devices, it will cut me from within. Um, oh, and so I need I need modified shoe wear. And I'm sorry to go into the details because I know it's kind of grim, but the, I need modified shoe wear inserts. Uh, to support the bones in a way that keeps me from injuring my foot I got in you. a new way. I, I understand. And, and in fact, it took, I injured my foot twice in two years and, and had to get some pretty serious uh, treatment both times. And each time I had to, I had to go on a device to prevent my walking on my foot altogether. So in fact, I had a peg leg um, that strapped to my knee. And uh, they kept my foot off the ground, and I actually walked upon my knee. Oh, um, no kidding. Yeah. How long and did you have that, to do that and for? And that, in turn, screwed up my back for a long time. Right. Uh, so it just it took a long time to finally get the inserts modified in such a way that, you know, they're right for my foot. And I don't I – I now can go hiking. I now can walk. Uh, you know, I was in New Orleans a couple weeks back, um, did 10,000 – steps each day that i was there so you know six miles of walking mm -hmm. um you know each day but uh, that took a while to reach the point where i could do that have you ever thought back to what could have been different in your life that would have either staved this off or helped it be i guess brought to light and and worked on quicker like i'm is there i might it's a ham-fisted question but is there something that could have happened differently that would have saved you this You deserve an accurate blood glucose meter. That doesn't sound like a big ask, but it can be if you have the wrong one. If you get the Contour Next One blood glucose meter, you will have an accurate, reliable blood glucose meter. Now, I don't know which meter you have right now, but did you do a bunch of looking into it before you got it? Um, did you read any reviews or find any kind of data on there. Oh, no, somebody just gave it to you, right? Well, the doctor was like, here's a meter. That's it. Your nurse practitioner just wrote you a script for the meter that they're accustomed to using. But you can have any meter. You don't just get the one someone gives you, right? You wouldn't buy a television like that. You wouldn't get a sofa without sitting on it. But for some reason, we take the blood glucose meter that people give us. You don't have to do that. You can go to contournext.com forward slash juice box right now and find out more about the contour next one blood glucose meter when you get there you're going to learn that this is an uh, an accomplished website that somebody painstakingly put together so much information and i am not kidding it's one of the most comprehensive sites i've ever seen for something like this something like this you know what i mean like a thing you know what i'm saying a device 
Boy, there's a long way to go to find the word device. Anyway, it's a seriously good website. It'll teach you a lot about the Contour Next One blood glucose meter. For instance, and I'll just give you some for instances, is the, uh, the test strips. You know how important they are. Well, you know, they're not all created equal either. The Contour Next One blood glucose meter test strips allow for second chance testing. So if you go in and like touch a little bit of blood, but don't get enough, you go back and get the rest without affecting the accuracy with the quality of the test. That's interesting, isn't it? No more wasted test strips. It also has a beautiful bright light for nighttime viewing. The screen is easy to read. It is very transportable, which is actually a word I looked it up, meaning that it's small and fits in your pocket or your purse or your diabetes bag without being so small that you can't handle it when you need to use it. That is functionality that you need. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. I'm tired of talking about it now. Just go buy it. I mean, after you finish listening to Casey and Cher, then you go get yourself a nice meter. You deserve a good meter. Seriously, what are you doing? You walking around with some janky ass busted meter. Get a good one. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Before we get back to the show, I want to let you know that you're going to meet Shira pretty soon. And there's some information at the end of the podcast if you'd like to find her online. And I'm going to come clean and tell you, I did not look up transportable. I just knew it was a word and I made it. I tried to be funny, but I didn't look it up, but it is a word. That's pretty much it. I'm going to get back to the show now. A few things. Um, I think early on um, efforts to, I actually, I mean, I think that that initial training in diabetes was really damaging. You know, the, the, the idea that, um, there was good and bad, that there were bad, good foods and bad foods. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, you know, the, the moral judgment, I think weighed heavily on me. Um, and, and I fight it today even, um, later when I went to camp, that, that was a message that wasn't, they, they actually were saying, no, you can, diabetes can eat just about anything. You just gotta, you just gotta manage it properly. Mm -hmm. Um, by then I was already (laughs) too far gone. Um, you know, I thought, I I thought I was getting away with something. I guess I, what I thought was an option for freedom was in fact a foolish, uh, 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 playing with fire. Yeah. And, uh, and I feel free now, um, free, I free feel freer now because I'm managing my diabetes and it, it, it protects the, the things that I care about, the energy that, and the energy that I need for those things. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, I didn't have that perspective when I was 10 or of course. 20 or 30. Did it um, help or hurt going to camp? Because did you just meet more people in your situation and you guys taught each other how to game the system more? No, no, I wouldn't say that. Okay. Um, so certainly we did share notes. Um, you know, like as a teenager, we sh- we'd share notes on how to drink alcohol and, and manage it successfully. So you didn't end up high or low, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, there, there are strategies for uh, dealing with alcohol and those sorts of things. Um, I guess what I would say instead, I, I certainly became aware of other kids who were um, engaged in the same sort of disordered eating that I was in. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I was with boys and, and young men because uh, this, was, this was the Jocelyn camp in Massachusetts. Um, uh, there was a girls camp and a boys camp near nearby one another. But uh, um I would say, and this is really important. Uh, this is sort of one of the things I wanted. This is sort of why I wanted to come and talk with you. Was one third of type one women will have suffered an eating disorder, and one sixth of the men will have suffered an, uh, an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, that means about five hundred sixty thousand Americans with type one. With type one, yeah, with suffering eating disorders, um, most of us don't get treatment, and certainly the men don't don't fess up. We we often don't even recognize, you know, as I said, I didn't re- I recognize that my my eating was messed up, but because I wasn't, I kept myself out of the hospital. I somehow told myself that I wasn't sick. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so finally, when I did go to the hospital, I, I kind of, you know, I, 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 I gave in. I, you know, I, I, I was fully, you know, fully admitted to myself that I was out of control. I don't know uh, another. It took, it took 30 years for me to admit that I was out of control. Right. I don't know a better way to ask this. I apologize. But did it ever feel hard to say because it felt like you had a girl's problem? Yeah. 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 It's, it still does. I'm fighting that now. Uh, as we're talking and that not um, just from yourself internally but from people outside i would imagine too yeah i guess I, i'm i'm growing more i probably didn't say it out loud to a friend until this past january hmm. when and i think it was really this past january when my recovery became conscious and solid you know i'd been in recovery for a few years at that point um but um, as I said, kind of half acidly, you yeah. know, um, I didn't really have a plan. I didn't really have any support system. Um, I didn't have a therapist or a support group. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing. And I, I wasn't aware of the, uh, the, our, our current understanding, our modern understanding of eating disorders and how they work. Mm-hmm. Um, I've sort of educated myself along with through uh, Shira Carpenter, who or, or, who we'll we'll talk talk to in a minute. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, that's. Uh... I, I guess what I would say is that you know it it took it took my saying to a friend who I'd known for close to close to forty years um, that this was going on with me, and I said this has been going on since you and I were kids, and he goes. How do I not know that, Tom? You yeah. know, it's, how did, how is that possible? Um, and it's just because I I was I kept it, I kept it a secret. Yeah, it was a you know deep dark secret for so long. Right. Well, I mean, I, expecting that someone could help you would seem uncommon to me. I, I know that sounds maybe strange to people who understand therapy and and have engaged in it uh, with probably a lot of success. But I don't know how you're involved in everything you're involved in. You have diabetes. You have these feelings about food. You're making these steps, doing these things, manipulating insulin. Um, and then just think, well, I'll just tell a friend that it'll get better. Like that doesn't even seem like a reasonable step, you know? No, but but I certainly have. And I One of the things I wanted to talk to you about, too, was what I think medical professionals need to do better. Mm-hmm. Um because there have been many times in my life where I confessed to them um, in one way or another what was going on, and none of them, absolutely none of them, until one nurse a couple years back um, asked me any exploratory questions, tried to uh, understand the extent uh, of what was going on. I mean, I would get in, I'd get a, I'd get crazy A1Cs. I once had an A1C of 17. Oh, my gosh. Right. Um, other time, m- much more commonly, I'd have an A1C of 12 or, or, or 13. Mm-hmm. Um, but nobody said, no one used that as a, as a, as a signal uh, to, to probe further to understand why was that A1C happening. Um, there was one nurse who, who did probe in, in an intelligent way. But what I got at the end of that was a referral to a nutritionist. Mm-hmm. I didn't need a nutritionist. I yeah. needed something. I needed probably at that point, I needed to be hospitalized and have a physical intervention. Right. Um, and I might have been ready for that. Uh, but what, what, what inevitably, inevitably, what would happen would be because there wasn't any, I got no sense that there was any alternative. I just felt like I, I'm, on a, I'm on a roller coaster and I can't get off. Yeah. Uh, and I don't see any way off of it. It's incredibly important for people to, I mean, it's trite to say, like, advocate for yourself, right? But what that really means, in my opinion, is that in a lot of cases, you're going to be getting medical care that's checkbox. Like, the doctor's got things they're supposed to do. They check the boxes off. You're not dead when you walked out of there. Yay, I did my thing. Bring in the next person. And then they have this kind of, in the back of their head idea, like, not everyone's going to succeed at this. So everyone I talk to doesn't have to look like they're doing great. Like, I don't know if that's a conscious thought, but I don't, I don't see it any differently. I've dealt with doctors on 
multiple levels for different problems. And the ones who stop and go, listen, I'm going to sit here with you and we're going to fix this right now. We're going to figure a plan out right now. They're not that many of them. Yeah. You know, but I I do think some of this is training. So the fact that, because I'm pretty sure that young women probably get a, a, a questionnaire sort of thing, a checklist of questions. Um, if not routinely, then uh, periodically. Right. Um, I I never was asked any any probing question in any any in any systematic way. And there were times in my life when I would have fessed up, yeah. um, when I was ready for change. Um, and I and and no, but nobody was asking. Right. Uh, so I, I would say, you know, a checklist in the same way that docs and therapists have a checklist of questions to ask folks who are, have problems with alcohol or with drugs. Um, they could certainly do the same thing for eating disorders. Um, Pediatricians. Beyond that, I would say, you know, when I did have a, an intelligent conversation about the behavior, what should have been part of the conversation was a, a plan. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, what is a reasonable plan to help somebody get recovered? Yeah. You know, are there resources to go to? Are there, I mean, there are physical treatment facilities. There are um, support groups. There are individual therapists and, and even therapists and support groups that specialize in diabetes or diabulimia. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so just some, a way, having, a, a pe- having that information available or, 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 you know, in reachable, right. in reach would a, be really, really a, a roadmap to look at to say, these are the steps I take because I am so lost at this point. I wouldn't know where to begin or what to do. And, and the probing questions thing is important. I was, I, I started to say that even at a certain age, pediatricians start asking questions that are clearly meant to see if you're depressed. Like yeah. I didn't like it's, it's obvious. Like you take your kids in for well visits and they, they, you know, they kind of couch it like a conversation, but they're clearly looking for signs of depression. Um, it's uh, an obvious thing to do, I would think. So, well, and I'm thinking that, 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 you know, that's, that's become part of the training that docs are getting. Yeah. Uh, so they've, they've had some exercise and doing that. I think that, you know, this is the thing because it's so prevalent among, uh, diabetes, uh, diabetics, um, certainly the endos ought to, ought to have it part of their routine. Yeah. You know? How, um, much do you think this could have been different if magically the technology that exists now would have existed when you were a child? Do you think that would have changed anything for you? Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe. Um, I think I would tell you now, I, I can't, t- how I can't tell you how important a CGM is for my current uh, good health. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the fact that um, I can track so closely and get such proactive notice when I'm going high or low. Um, as, as I sort of learned these tricks from you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, ha- I had to retrain myself in diabetes because for at least 20 years, I'd, I'd been acting like I didn't have it. Yeah. Um, so well, not you know, that it would change the the psychological issues that any person has, but you did describe earlier not leaving a range helps you on the physical side. Yeah. And yeah. And just having an understand. I mean, when's the really when's the first time in your life with type one that you really felt like you understood how to make impacts with insulin? Oh, I don't know. I guess I, I being positive. <laughs> funny, I was, Maybe I was I joking say. to myself, you know, bold with insulin. I, 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 I was bold with insulin pretty early on, although it wasn't part of my early training. Um, as soon as regular was available and we, we were discussing, we, I learned about pre bolusing back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, that was pretty powerful. And I certainly took advantage of it at times. And I appreciated how how uh, how much control one could get um, for, for those periods of time that I was actually following the plan. Right. Um, I now use those techniques uh, all the time. So uh, setting my basal uh, carefully and correctly, um, you know, pre bolusing uh, regularly. Uh, a course correcting all the time. So following the arrows and, and heading them off at the pass, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that, that really, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm doing MDI at the moment. I'm supposed to go on Omnipod shortly, but, um, but I've got a, uh, an A1C that's nearly normal. Wow. And, um, 
And that's that's because of the sort of the active steps that I now can take with the, the, the data I get from the CGM. Right. Now, it's uh, I mean, it's obvious if you're if anybody is paying attention, it's, it's completely obvious. I was just wondering, I, I guess I was looking for an answer similar to the one you gave so people can understand that just the technology alone isn't going to stave off an eating disorder. Like, yes, it, well, it doesn't right. mean you can't be diagnosed in 2021 and have this happen to you because you can see your data suddenly. Um, and I, there mean, are... I would say there, there, the, the two things that enabled me to recover are certainly, <laughs> I would say, um, your podcast and the support group that Shira runs. Wow. Uh, those two things have been my most useful tools uh, for getting my life back. Oh. Um, I'm sorry. You, those statements take me by surprise. Um all the time. And then I get this, it just so people can understand, I get this weird sensation up my spine and it makes me a little lightheaded and like to think <laughs> of you, like I, we don't know each other. Um, but I am connected enough to my feelings to, uh, not be able to kind of in a blase way, just roll past somebody saying that, um, I'm very happy for you. I'm ecstatic that the podcast helped you at all. And, uh, it, it's, a uh, it's very gratifying and uh, makes me happy. It's, I don't know it's way to really put been it. crucial, Scott. Yeah, I'm glad. And, uh, well, that's I mean, I'd, I'd say, I mean, the after dark episodes sort of led me to kind of reach out to you finally. But um, I, I kind of went through. I haven't listened to all the all the podcasts, of but course. I listened to so many of them, and certainly all the pro tips. Um, and then some of the pro tips more than once. Yeah. Um, and they they sort of made this you know tight control possible. Um, you know, I was doing okay before I was listening to the podcast, but yeah. this, this really tightened the, closed all the gaps and, right. you know, tightened everything up for me. That's, uh, uh, it's amazing. I just think that, I mean, I, I don't know how many times I could possibly say it, but people at the very least deserve an understanding, some tools and a shot, y you know, like, is everyone going to come through diabetes the same? I don't think so. I think there are a lot of variables that are personal that might stop a person from being as interactive or caring or whatever, but still everyone should have a shot at it. Like everyone should, you know, I don't know. They should have a chance. Oh, yeah, uh, I absolutely agree with you. And this sort of, I mean, my desire to come on the show um, was to get the word out to other diabetics like me Yeah, that you don't have to stay on the roller coaster. You can get off the ride. Right. Um, you can get your life back. It's possible. Well, I'm, I I didn't know it was possible for thirty years. I didn't know it was possible. Right. It's, it kind of makes me angry that it took me so long. Yeah, um, it helps to hear other people succeed, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. it sure does. Yeah. 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 Well, one of the things I like about hearing the uh, reading the Facebook posts on on the, on on your Facebook link. It's, yeah. You know those those tales. Young kids, young, older folks. It doesn't matter. They're uh, they're. They're inspiring. Yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, well, Shira's here. Hold on a second. I'm going to let her in. Her audio is connecting. Well, I'm officially, I'm officially the only one without a camera. Hi, Shira. How are you? Good. Hi. How are you? Good. Uh, we are still recording and won't stop, just so you know. Uh, okay. But if you take a second to introduce yourself, that'd be terrific. Awesome. I am Shira Sharpentier from Living Proof MN, um, based in Bloomington, Minnesota. Well, it's nice of you to do this. I really appreciate it. Excellent. Uh, Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, so we've basically gone through, you know, uh, the story and, and we're, we're up to present day. And I think if you don't mind, it, it, unless, in, unless um, you think otherwise... In case you want to ask a different question, I, I'm just interested to know how you got started in this and um, so we can get a little footing for who you are. Sure. So um, I am now 38 years old. Um, I struggled with an eating disorder between the ages of um, about seven and 30. So this October, I'll be celebrating eight years in recovery. Wow. I would consider myself recovered. Um, probably the last three ish years, I would say I've been, um, much more confident to say that, um, my struggle 
was a combination because of trauma as a child, uh, perfectionism, really high standards for my parents, um, high expectations, and you know, just not really feeling like I was good enough compared to my sister. Mm-hmm. And my eating disorder really mer- morphed throughout the 20 some years from anorexia to overexercising to orthorexia to bulimia to binge eating back to bulimia and a- anorexia and just the whole gamut. And I was in and out of treatment, tried so many different therapists, went to different states for treatment. And um, I didn't do well, to say the least, in treatment. It was not a positive experience or environment for me. And I remember my therapist at the time, who I really, really, really loved, um, it it was probably life-changing for me. But before we ended our time together, um, he said, you haven't failed treatment. Treatment has failed you. And that has stuck with me since then. And I decided to leave treatment, um, the whole treatment world, not just that place, but just in general, when I was either going to, I really felt like I was going to die in treatment. It was really, really devastating for me to be there. And it made my eating disorder way worse. And I was getting away with so much that they couldn't control me. And so I decided to leave because I was like, I'm not going to die in a treatment center. And I'd rather try living outside of here. And if I die trying to live, then that's at least I tried. Mm -hmm. And so I left and I was the best decision ever made, um, found my, my power, found my confidence, found my freedom. I mean, I, I basically came back to myself that I guess I never even knew. And, um, I really could not find any of the resources. Honestly, the thing that was the most helpful was going to AA groups And I did that for many months right after I left because there was nothing else. And they actually helped me get to my first 100 days of no eating disorder symptoms. And for me at that time, it was uh, restricting and purging a lot. Um, And so just kept going and going and I would slip up and then we'd start over again and finally got to 100 days. And um, it's been just an amazing ride since then. Um, I started Living Proof of Men Technically, two years ago when I started, um, we opened up the nonprofit, but about four years ago, I started mentoring people one-on-one in person and through through the phone, basically. Uh, After I would go share my story at a treatment center about my recovery, people come up to me and say, hey, can I get your phone number? I'd love to just talk with you. And I realized that's exactly what people are looking for is connection, someone that's been through it, lived experience, someone that really gets it, and no bullshit. I think that's been probably the best part of living proof is I, I tell people straight and I don't know if people ever really did that to me. It was sort of like tiptoeing around things, walking eggshells, kind of coddling. And I tell people right off the bat, like, this is me. And if you want something different, like there's other people out there, but my whole goal is to get people to recovery, not for them to need me the rest of their life. Like that's, that's definitely not what I want to create here. So living ask- proof has been amazing the last couple of years. Yeah, that's, it does sound amazing. I wanted to ask you if you could tell me the difference between what standard treatment is, what you found when you left it and how it's morphed into what you do. Yeah. So standard treatment you know, I can see the merit in it, right? I really think standard treatment is for, to get people out of that critical zone where, you know, maybe kidneys, liver, pancreas, heart, brain are all affected and trying to get nutrition into them. I don't see treatment centers as a place to actually recover. I think it's really a stabilization and trying to at least get nutrition in somebody when they're really resistant. Um, Sure. I tend to think of them as detox centers. Is that accurate? I think that, yeah. 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 But that's not going to fix the reason why you have the disordered eating. No. And they really focus on the food, the weight piece, which for me, it wasn't really the, the, primary cause of my eating disorder, which I think the majority of people don't start an eating disorder, don't fall into an eating disorder because they want to be a different size. It's because they're not confident. They're not uh, self-assured. 
they feel like they're less than other people, they're judged, they're whatever it is. That's, you know, eating disorders are not, I think the rap is like, oh, you don't like your body, but that comes later when you're so wrapped up in an eating disorder, all you then do is focus on your body because you're malnourished. But in the beginning, most people, majority of people do not start because of their body. So treatment centers really don't work on the ma- the mind, the retraining, the brain, reframing, um, you know, building a new life for yourself. And like, you can't build a new life for yourself when you're enclosed in four walls and not having fresh air for four weeks. Mm-hmm. That was my experience. And, and so, you were, if I can stop you, in that situation, you were still finding ways to involve yourself in the disorder right under, yeah. the, under their nose. Were they not trying to stop you or did they not know how to look for it even? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I mean, the problem is with this disease and disorder is it's very ste- sneaky and manipulative. Yeah. And if somebody doesn't want to get better, they don't want to get better. It's easy enough it's for them. It's almost to not. nearly impossible to convince somebody until they actually want to get better. Okay. And what do you think, you know, what do you think your thing was? Like, what made you, is it rock bottom? Is that what we're talking about? Or I mean, I feel like I hit that several times. For me, I I knew I wasn't living, I didn't want to live like that. I was completely miserable. I was sick of being sick. I couldn't live a normal life. And when I looked at other people, I was like, I have spent 30 years of my life sick. Right. And I'm done with this. And I don't I like, I know there's more for me, but um, I didn't, I really didn't know how to get there. Mm-hmm. But I think that was my turning point was like actually wanting something different. And I just didn't know how to exactly do that yet. So is it, is it, I'm trying, I'm trying very hard to understand. So um, is it sort of like rabbit holes and cycles? You just get caught in something and before you know it, it's a way of life and that's what you do. And then that becomes your thing. And I, this is such a, this is not a great example, but um, in my like early twenties, this is going to sound stupid maybe, but cigar smoking became very like popular among young kids. Mm-hmm. And and so you'd have to go to a store that sold cigars because they were in humidors. And then eventually going to buy one became like a lot of work. So you bought a humidor for your house. Then you ha- kept some with you. And then before mm-hmm. you know it, I was like, why are we smoking cigars so frequently? Mm-hmm. And, and I just like, wow, like we've gotten caught in a thing. Like we made a pattern for ourselves. Like it's and not on purpose. Like you could see how it, it broke down. And I stopped and I was like, I don't mean to be doing this this frequently. Mm-hmm. What do I do? And I took the cigars and the humidor and I pushed them in the garbage. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm going to break whatever this little cycle is right here. But- you know, what? It's, it is, it's similar to what you're saying, but you know what the hard part is no. with eating disorders is that you can't get rid of food. You have to eat. You actually have to build a new relationship with food, your body, society, you know, diet culture, um, your confidence, like you being you, you can't. Like you have to stop trying to be somebody else and you just have to be like, this is me, right. take it or leave it kind of thing. And that's, that's the hard thing is like, it's not like another addiction because you take away the food you take or not the food, the cigars, the drinking, the drugs, whatever it is, the sexting, whatever you, can still you take it away. Yeah. You can't, live you can't without take food. food away. Right. So, oh, okay. Well, that makes a ton of sense. I, and it's, op- it's incredibly obvious now that you said it, but yet I, so you, have an issue it builds a bad cycle around a thing that you can't avoid you have yeah. to have this food if you don't have this food you'll end up in such a dire medical situation yeah that you end up in one of these kind of cookie cutter scenarios where they're just trying to get you better but no one's addressing any of the things that got you to this position to begin with it becomes a Correct. medical th- it starts as a psychological issue yep but by the time you get to treatment it's a medical issue Totally. And yeah, that's a talk. great way to look at it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then you get out, you recognize you need something. How mm-hmm. did it, how did AA help you? I think it was the community. They were so positive. Like, oh my God, Shira's here. How was your night? Like, how was the rest of your day? And I'm like, oh, it was really hard. And they're like, but you came back, you know, like they were just so supportive, positive, like they never were putting me down. They're never like thinking that I couldn't do it. 
And when I started like racking up like two days, five days, seven, I mean, celebration, talk about when you walk in and like, you're like, I did another day. And they were like more happy than I've ever seen anybody for myself. Yeah. So I think that was, that was the, one of the biggest things. And we try to do that. You know, every time we start a group, we, what are your victories? What have you succeeded in? You know, what have you challenged yourself and done better? And just getting people to recognize like small things are actually huge. And they do add up over time. A question that might sound unfair, but I think it needs to be asked. How helpful is it to be in a scenario with people who you feel like can't judge you? Not that they won't judge you, but that they're in your position and they can't judge you. I think it's huge. Okay. Huge. Okay. And And if you're, if you're just sitting with a clinician, a therapist, whatever dietitian, you know, there is a hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. And as a mentor, the reason why I didn't go and get my therapy degree was because I want to be able to share my story. When you're sitting with a therapist, there's rules and regulations. You can't talk about yourself. So if I went and got a degree to quote unquote, do this, like the general population wants to think that I can do this, Mm -hmm. it would take away my ability to relate to people, which is exactly what they need. They need to relate to somebody that's been there, done it, got through it. That's how you build confidence in other people. And like, wow, I actually want to live a life like Shira has, like Casey is starting to build, like Tasha, like when you actually start seeing people in recovery, people are like, want to emulate that. And that's, I think, what's lacking in this whole treatment center is you don't really see anybody that's getting better. Yeah. You're not going to find an argument with me. I've had people ask (laughs) me like, why don't you become like a diabetes, like something, something like, Oh, then you'd, there'd be rules to follow. And those rules lead to the exact thing you're trying to get away from. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Not that it's not important. Like, by the way, not that it's not important that there's a place where somebody whose internal organs are shutting down can go. Absolutely. Right. right. That all makes sense. Yep. But, but you have to be able to have this other piece. And Casey, is that what kind of lit you up about Shira? Was, did you find sameness in her conversations? Um, I think initially it was, <laughs> well, initially what, what brought me into Shira was I was reaching out. I realized that I, had, I was flying solo um, without any support at all um, and kind of uh, without any guidance, without any model. Um, and I went looking for therapists that took my insurance. That was nearly impossible. And I was looking for diabolemic specialists. That was nearly impossible. Um, the ones I did reach out to were either they were fully booked or they didn't take my insurance. Mm -hmm. Um, and the national eating disorder, um, uh, association, uh, national eating disorders.org NADA, um, had Shira listed as providing during COVID uh, remote uh, support groups. Wow. So I just reached out to her and and in the very first meeting, there was discussion of recovery. And I was like, no one's, I've never heard that. Um, (laughs) The idea that (laughs) it might be gone one day didn't, didn't occur to you ever. Well, I guess my impression was that I, and I, in fact, just that week I'd had a conversation with my friend uh, my friend Jeff, who you t- you talked to in a, I think a couple weeks, um, about other things. He, I know he's he's got a different agenda than I do. Uh, <laughs> but I was talking with him. He was the one I confessed that I had an eating disorder to, and he was shocked after forty years. Yeah. Um, because I'd never shared it with him. But I told him then that while this is something, thinking it was like alcoholism, it's something I'm going to live with the rest of my days. You know, it's, I've got to fight it all the time, and and just thinking that way sounds like ongoing hell. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact is you can reach a point and, and this, I've, I've come to believe that this, this is sort of the way I'm living now. Uh, and I can see that Shira lives that way is that you can reach a point where yes, it's part of you. You, you remember that it was part of you, um, but you don't have to practice it every day. It's not something that haunts you every day. It's um, you know, you can de- redefine yourself, retrain your brain to think in new ways, yeah. Um, find new coping mechanisms for the things that that are troubling in life. You know, the things that trouble everyone: anxiety and stress, and and so forth. Um, you know, I think I think that recovery. I've come to believe that recovery is truly possible, right. and and yeah, I can see it. I can taste it. It's it's a wonderful thing. I I I feel better now than I 
than than I did when I was thirty. Is it um, easier to mirror because she did it? Because uh, you, she gives me the confidence that I can. Okay. You know, I, she she makes me believe that it's 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 an attainable goal. I see. Do you think it's sure? Do you think it's harder for a clinician who doesn't or hasn't had an eating disorder to help somebody with one? Yes, definitely. I mean, they're, you know, learning out of a textbook, right? And the statistics for recovery are not good. Hmm. Um, One death every 52 minutes of a direct result to an eating disorder. Hmm. That's terrible. The recovery rate is like, they say it's like 55 something percent, but I, I don't know. I think that's a little high to actually full recovery. It's almost nearly impossible for me to find, we try to have speak speakers on Wednesday nights, our, our recovery night, mm-hmm. story night. And so I kind of, you know, um, talk to people beforehand and kind of, you know, kind of ask them, what does their recovery look like? And I'm like, are you sure you're in recovery? Yeah. I'm like, that doesn't sound like the recovery that I'm trying to like, you know, model for people. And so, I mean, I'm just having a hard time even finding people that are like actually in recovery and not using some other means to, manage their weight, manage their stress, you know, just ill coping strategies. Um, It doesn't mean just because you can eat that you're in recovery, right? It really has to do with the mindset. And I think that's what people forget is like, you can come out of treatment eating and maybe your weight's gone up. Great. But is your mind still focused on, you know, consumed by calories and by food and what you look like and how many um, steps you take today? Like, that's the things that takes time to retrain your brain on. Sure. I asked Casey, I'm going to ask you too, uh, in, in, when you're embroiled in this, how much of your life is taken up by it? Oh my God. I would say 99.9%. You, you you feel, you think you're doing fine in the world, but you are not present at all. Mm -hmm. Any, is it difficult to have personal relationships? Yes. Very, Um, very. Wow. So, and so much secrecy, you know? Yeah. Well, between you and yourself, between yourself and yeah. other people around you, too, right? Do you, or exactly. uh, that, that would be my question is, were you 100% conscious or were you lying to yourself as well? Oh, I was lying to myself. I mean, I went to nursing school and I was one, that was one of my sickest points was, um, was during that year. I went through a, an accelerated program. I honestly don't even remember much of that year. Mm. I was really not doing well. And, you know, people said like, you really should take a break and go get help. And I'm like, Oh no, I got this. You know, I'm getting A's. I should be fine. Like I'm fine. Right. Yeah. No, that's crazy. Hey, and I, there's so many people leading lives like this, parents, spouses, you know, daughters, aunts, your next door neighbor, you would, and like Casey said, his best friend I had no idea. Didn't even know. I have the same question for both of you. Um, it may be anecdotal to get the answer, but, um, do you see this more frequently with certain religious backgrounds, parenting styles? Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, um, mm-hmm. people who would maybe use guilt as a parenting tool versus co- like, do you know what I mean? Like, I know that that sounds very incredibly generalized, but I'm 50. I'm still allowed to generalize. I'm grandfathered <laughs> in, in the world. So, um, but I know we don't do that anymore, but still, I talk to a lot of people who have type 1 diabetes who come from an English or Irish background. I talk to a lot of people who, when I hear them describe their upbringings, you go, were you Catholic? And they go, yeah, how'd you know? And I'm like, oh, like, is there like, you know, that kind of stuff? Like you said, you, your parents, it sounded to me like what you were telling me was that your parents pitted you against your sister in an attempt to make you in their eyes as good as she was. Like that's like, and that's a weird thing to do to a child so um like do you see your parents as monsters or do you see them as just not good at parenting you know i i we've i my relationship with them has completely changed since i've been in recovery okay um there was just a lot of a lot of pressure um my dad is um came to America when he was 21 from Israel and just a very, very strict upbringing from his own childhood. Mm -hmm. A lot of expectation, you know, like the American dream, like he has lived it. And he put that on my sisters and me. 
and, you know, being perfect and high attaining. And if you're going to do something, do it a hundred percent, you know, don't fail. And it was, it was very tense. I should say in my house. It's interesting because immigrant is probably one of the things like first generation is one of the things I left off that idea that there's this amazingly better place and all of a sudden you have access to it and don't Mm -hmm. waste it because yes blah 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 because i know so many people who'd kill to be here and have this opportunity and etc etc and then having good i'm sorry and and think about you as a child you know that you're destroying your life and you're full of shame you're full of guilt you don't know how to get yourself out of it. And then the more shame and guilt you feel, the worse seating sort of becomes. Mm -hmm. So it's like a terrible cycle, right? And it's, it's just so, so hard to pull yourself out of that, um, that lack of esteem for yourself when you've kind of been pigeonholed um, into wanting a better life. And you're like, well, I'm trying to do the best I can. Was any part of your recovery telling your parents? Oh gosh. Yes. Yeah. That was one of the turning points for me was I wrote a letter to each of them. Um, and I wrote, read it to them out loud and it wasn't so much that they needed to understand or sympathize or apologize. But for me, it was after 30 years, actually being able to say everything I wanted to say. Yeah. And it was, I, I tell everybody I work with almost everybody you need whoever it is that's sort of stifling you, or you feel like you're needing to live up to those expectations. You have to tell them how you feel because it's the only way to sort of break down that wall and say, you know what? I'm living my life. Mm-hmm. I love that you're caring about me and want the best for me, but I'm, I've been living your life and look what happened to me. Right. Like I need to take ownership and responsibility. And that was, that was a huge turning point for me. It's also completely unfair. Like a a grown person telling a child, don't, don't fail, succeed. I mean, that might actually be reasonable advice for another 45 year old person you're talking to like, Hey, try harder. You know what I mean? Or like, we, we, we got to take advantage of this, but it just doesn't translate to a child. Like not at all. And I, I would say, I mean, my experience with my parents were, my dad was never a perfectionist, but my mother is. Uh, but she didn't really impose that upon us. But I think we got it anyway. We caught the bug anyway. Right. Um, they, and so certainly, you know, I struggle with, with the own my own perfectionism. And that's just, you know, un, so un, uh, unrealistic goals, unrealistic goal setting um, is, is really is, is, is part of the problem. And you feel more hardwired towards that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, if not hardwired, then at least I was modeling Her. behavior that I saw. Right. You know, so it wasn't like I had a, a monster of a parent. It was so much as I had a parent who was struggling with some of the same issues. And although they didn't get expressed in eating disorder for her, uh, they certainly are just as problematic in her life in other ways. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, yeah. Well, I, I just think that's good for people to hear because you – because, sure, I'm – you know, I'm trying to do the same thing you're trying to do, which is let enough of your story out that people hearing it might find themselves in it a little bit and Absolutely. and see a pathway right. for it. Um, yeah. So I guess the the big leap here is because you said it, right? You didn't fail at therapy. Therapy failed you. How mm-hmm. do you not, <clears throat> when you have so little either financial ability or insurance or even energy left in your body and you've decided to make a leap, how do you not get frozen thinking you're going to make the wrong choice for who you talk to? Yeah, that's super hard. And, you know, I talk to parents a lot. They, you know, call like my daughter just got diagnosed. My son is exhibiting X, Y, Z. I don't know what to do. And, you know, they're reading reviews and they're talking to people that have been there. And there's a lot of toxic places and people and therapists that say they know what they're doing. And I think they're causing a lot more harm Mm -hmm. than good. And so, I mean, I tell parents all the time, you have to go with your gut. If you've got a child under 18, you know them best. Do not put them in a professional's um, hands just because they're professional. You have to feel like they're actually going to be able to help. And if you're seeing signs that your child is getting worse, then that is a sign that that is not a good relationship. And there's something you you need to do something different. And I, I tell people all the time, you can 
move around as much as you need to, Mm -hmm. right? Like if something isn't clicking, then it's not clicking. And a lot of people go to treatment for the first time and learn so many more eating disorder behaviors and rules and sneakiness. Like, unfortunately, it's kind of a breeding ground for becoming more entrenched in your eating disorder, which is exactly what we don't want. Mm -hmm. But where else do we put people that need, like you said, critical and need stabilization? I don't know. Yeah. It's like sort of the same idea as putting people in prison. And now you've taken all the great criminal minds and put them together. Put all together. And next thing you know, you need the super friends. Um, yeah. So I, and, oh, wow. So if I get put into a situation like that, I'm not really ready to make a change. No. Then these people are just teaching me how to jimmy a lock faster. And, yes. and I, and I fake my way out of that scenario, go back into my life and, and just do it better than I was doing it before. And by better, I mean, more privately, harder yes. to, to detect. Yeah, that happens a lot. Wow. A lot. Our, our, I mean, for me, I, I, Scott, I wish that I'd had physical intervention. Um, I'm lucky. I'm lucky that I am, or I, I, I really am lucky that I, I got out of the physical challenge, uh, sort of under my own steam, so to speak. Um, some of that had to do with, do with the fact that I was physically disabled for a time, mm-hmm. and so couldn't. I uh, couldn't practice the same bullshit that I was engaged in. Um, but it took losing a relationship for me to sort of have another comeuppance and then reach out for, for Shira. Yeah. Um, you know, what I would say, though, is that diabetics especially are at risk in the early days of recovery. So um, initial recovery uh, and you, when you start taking your insulin again, suddenly your body uh, starts to retain water. So they, 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 they tend to gain water weight really fast. And it's scary for someone who's so fixated on, on weight and appearance. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it doesn't last. The bloating, the bloating passes. Your, your body, uh, in time, if you continue to, to treat your diabetes properly, um, uh, it, that'll settle down, right. but it's scary for, for a stretch of time. Um, the other thing is it can accelerate complications some, and, and probably temporarily, but it can be dangerous. So, you know, the, the change in blood pressure, uh, can cause, so you start taking your insulin again, your blood, get your blood sugars into control. They might be high, but the, but you're taking your insulin that's going to, that can cause problems with eyes, with kidneys, with, uh, neuropathy, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. We, that too may that. pass in, in time, but if you're not under someone's care, then it's really risky. And I wasn't, I, I, how I managed to dodge those bullets. I don't know. Yeah. Um, probably what just I've got been, lucky. What I've, what I've read is that <clears throat> sometimes recovery in the short term can be really dangerous and you ought to have someone, a, a doc, uh, keeping an eye on you for those things. Tracking so I, I kind of wish I'd gone through a detox situation, a 30 day kind of thing, um, provided I was ready for change. Yeah. yeah. If I wasn't ready for change, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have stuck. It wouldn't have done any good. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I want to make sure that we got that out there is that, you know, if you're going to get recovery, if you go into recovery, do it with some caution. You don't have to do it all at once. I mean, right. I, I think, uh, I kind of got this from Shearer's group too. It would be, you know, uh, set reasonable goals. Um, forgive yourself the the slips. You know, if you make, you're going to make mistakes. Forgive yourself those. Don't beat yourself up over them, and don't use them as a as an excuse to go back to the old ways. Right. And celebrate the victories, small as they may be. You know, I think the victories become bigger over time. But you know, I think those those three things are really crucial. Yeah, I agree. Sure. Can I ask you a question? It's going to sound self-serving for half a second, but you'll see through it. Um, in your time with Casey, did you, can you see any benefit that my podcast had on him? Yeah, he was super excited to tell us about it. You know, I've been following this guy. Um, he's got these great podcasts up. Um, I feel like I could really add to his community. Um, I mean, he was just, he lit up about you and to our group and he's, you know, talked about it and um, just so, so excited to be able to share his story um, and share the awareness and, you know, with so many people out there that are struggling in silence for sure. So what you heard from him was more of the community piece. So you're, you're not, 
you're not specifically helping people with diabulimia. You're helping all no. all people with disordered eating. So yes. So did you not get much into the diabetes piece with him? Like, were you able to help Casey without understanding that side of it? So I am a nurse in my background, but really I don't practice that in Living Proof MN. I try to keep that separate. I mean, we really, I mean, he's free to talk about that piece. And he has mentioned it, you know, sometimes, you know, I've dealt with this or, or this kind of challenged me, or I realized this, but that wasn't our main focus. And even in our support groups and the mentoring that I do, the focus is not on food and weight. It's on finding your joy, your passion, living life outside your eating disorder. Um, who do you want to be? Who do you want to show up as in this world? Um, building self-confidence, huge. We talk about that a lot new relationships, boundaries, um, hobbies. So really, you know, he did bring that to the group, but there was never like, we're going to specifically talk about this. That's Um, yeah. I just wanted to make sure that I, that people listening understood that maybe you don't need to specifically find somebody who knows how to help people with type one. Maybe you need to talk to somebody who understands the psychological side of it. You can understand the diabetes on your own. This, yep. this is an odd, like, sideline question, but is it harder to help people if they're cynical by nature? Yes. Yeah, because it feels like what you're talking about, you know, when you say happy and joy and fulfilled to some people, they hear they hear BS, 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 nobody's really happy, like that kind yeah. of thing. Yes. Yeah. So cynicism would get in the way as well. It and pessimism and, you know, I've failed so many times I can't do this or, you know, I'm weak. Nobody believes in me. I mean, I said, I'm like, throw all that out. You guys stop saying those things. The more you say it, the more you believe it. Yeah. Right. And I mean, Casey's got such an amazing positive attitude. As she said, it, sure. Cause, cause I'm yeah. as, I'm as, pro- I, I can be as cynical as they come. You can be, but you, your attitude, like, you're very pensive and very like thought provoking. And you're like, I need to think about this before I say something. And at the same time, you can tell that you do want a different life. And I think that's kind of what it takes is like, I don't know how to get there myself, but I don't want this anymore. Right. 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 And it, it's all, I, mean, I just find it can be incredibly detrimental to have that, like that it, this can't work. I'm yeah, not, I'm not going to find it. It's not for me. I used to hear people say a lot, sure, that there were like different kinds of diabetes. That mm-hmm. always threw me off. Like I have the kind that's harder. And I was like, well, <laughs> you get the same kind as everybody else has, you, you know, like, and so um, like, and don't get me wrong, like somebody could have gastroparesis or something that's really impactful of how insulin works in their body in re- the relationship to the food. But I was always thrown off by the idea that you know, I, I heard it said as a as a soothing tool, like, don't worry, your di- your diabetes may vary from somebody else's, right? So you might not get the same outcome they would get, which is true. But if you step back far enough, you can see all the variables that impact the, in- the insulin in the food. And mm-hmm. if you understand them all well enough, then mm-hmm. different, seemingly different people can have similar outcomes. And yeah. to me, whether you get to it or not, I mean, that's, I put this out in the world, people can do with what they want with it. I just don't want them to think that they're predestined to not win. Yeah. You know, that's a dangerous feeling to have. Totally. And like Casey said, I was in treatment for years and most of the people that come here are 10 plus years in their own uh, eating disorder, almost never hear the word recovery. Now that boggles my mind. Yeah. Why are we not trying to instill hope in people? You know, uh, look at your potential. Um, you know, this person has done it. You can too. Literally, they tell you, you're going to live with an eating disorder the rest of your life. You need to learn how to manage it. Yeah. We'll probably see you every few months or a year to come in for a tune-up. Hello, we're not we're not vehicles. I wonder if it's the finality of it because while you're talking, it occurs to me that in in a modern Western medicine, everything's about management, except cancer, where they try yeah. to they try to cure you. Because yeah. if they don't, cancer kills you. So yeah. so it's the idea that we can keep fine tuning because you're not going to drop dead tomorrow. We have time to work on it. But when they feel that feeling of, oh no, this has to get taken care of right away. Western medicine stops talking about management and starts talking about curing. 
It's inter- yeah. it's interesting, and I wonder if you didn't just take that that piece for yourself, where you said, "Look, we're not going to mess with this forever. Like, let's try to find an end to it." Um, I mean, I, I believe I did believe it for quite a while, right? Because psychiatrists, therapists, dietitian, um, occupational therapists, literally everybody was telling me the same thing. Yeah, this is an ongoing thing. You're going to have to do this forever. Yeah. This is what happens. I've got bills to pay. I got three kids in college. You better keep coming here. <laughs> I mean, not that not that it's maybe not that for them, but maybe that's just how they're taught that it's a process. Um, I don't know. I think it's a it's an amazing idea to just say, look, maybe there's an end to this. Let's mm-hmm. let's all look for it. You know, mm-hmm. I, it yeah. can't hurt to look. I mean, listen, if it it can't hurt to look for it, if you never find it, you're still in treatment, right? Right. right. You know. Yeah. And Scott, I would tell you, you know, that w- what I practice now. Is, is kind of actively listening to my own thoughts. Um, sometimes I'll get an urge, sometimes at ridiculous moments, I'll get an urge to eat something stupid. Um, for no, sometimes for no good reason. Or um, the, the, I think of the eating disorder as a, and an, on, some people think of their eating disorder as a monster. Hmm. Um, I think that gives it too much power. I think when you do that, you invest it with too much power. Um, I tend to think of it as an unruly younger version of myself. And so I've gotten pretty good at talking to it like a parent, like I'm a parent to it. Yeah. So like, no, we're not doing that today. You know, don't be ridiculous. We are not, you know, we are not eating ice cream at the moment. You've got an interview for a juice box podcast, you know, Um, (laughs) uh, that whatever, you know, that kind of thing. But um, I can adopt a, a distance from it. I can listen to it, but I don't have to act on it. And I can let it, I can let it kind of do its thing. I can, I can have it throw its tantrum in the aisle at the, at the department store, Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not going to buy the toy. Um, I wonder if people just in general, don't give themselves enough credit for having power over their actions. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think we train ourselves, you know, the folks suffering eating disorders, we've trained ourselves to give in to the voice. Mm Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I don't, and I, and I don't recommend actively fighting it either. Cause that again, gives it too much power. Right. Um, I want to treat it like, no, you're just an annoying part of my, uh, reptile brain, um, right. screaming, you know, th- throwing an ant, uh, throwing a tantrum and I'm going to ignore you. I'm going to ignore you till you get tired. So the, um, those urges aren't a separate thing. They're you and yeah, who'd be yeah, better to right. tell you what to do than you. It's my brain misbehaving, right? You know, uh, but I, but I, I, I can separate myself enough from it. Sort of like, it's I'm not, I'm not broken. I'm not, you know, I'm. Uh, there's nothing wrong with me per se. Um, I, I can now, I can now recognize that. Okay, now this is just my brain acting up, and if I don't act on it, then in a few minutes, in an hour. I'll be back to I'll be back and and I won't be thinking that way. You're making me uh, wonder if we took you and threw you back in time where there was no food to have an eating disorder with if you would just be like the person in the tribe who caused the like like how would that come out of you? Like do you know what I mean? Like do, do you see what I'm saying sure? Like if if there was literally no food to do that with, where yeah. would those impulses lead somebody who had mm-hmm. that feeling? Uh, we'll never know, but it just made me never wonder know. all of a sudden. I, all of a sudden, I pictured Casey in a loincloth, and I was, <laughs> yeah. like, I was like wondering what he would like be up to. <laughs> um, is there anything I'm not asking either of you that you think should get put in here? Hmm. Share how I do, because I don't know anything great. about this. So, Yeah, is this your first sort of eating disorder? No, I've had a number of conversations with people with diabulimia. Um, okay. But I... So I, I have these different kind of, I mean, it's one podcast, but yeah, I tried to, I try to have conversations with people about things that nobody talks about. Mm-hmm. So I end up calling them after dark episodes, which I actually hate doing because I don't think they should be, you know, under the cover of night, but I think that's how people think of them. We talk yeah. about sex and diabetes and drugs and, and all the things that people do that everybody pretends doesn't happen. Um, mm-hmm. that brought out a lot of people with eating disorders that want to talk. It brought out a lot of people with, um, bipolar disorder that wanted to talk as well. Um, yeah. and what I've learned is that I don't know what I'm talking about. So I don't pay attention. I don't judge anybody. 
Mm-hmm. And I just try to ask what seems like the next most reasonable question based on what they've asked. Like there was a, a, a lovely young girl on that talk, said to me, I want to come on and talk about taking drugs safely. And I was like, uh, okay. So she's, you know, in her early twenties, she's like, I take a lot of psychedelics and there's ways to get them tested at fairs and raves and everything. And I want people to know. And I was like, okay. And she's talking and she said things in the course of that conversation that did not jive with my understanding of the world. Mm-hmm. And I just said, I just asked the next most logical question that didn't judge what she said. Mm-hmm. And that leaves it to other people listening to decide and takes sure. it out of my hands. Because if I make a judgment while we're talking, then the people listening will largely accept my judgment. Yeah. So it's important for me not to do that. Mm-hmm. And so I, I learned to talk to people better because, which is the, the podcast has been crazily helped me helpful for me in that way, because I used to be when I was younger, like a lot of younger people, I just thought I was right about things. And I had a a point of view. And a lot of people don't have a point of view. Uh Like if you get people together and get them talking, sometimes just the most confident person wins. Uh And and that was definitely me for a while. And but I just kept thinking that other people who don't jive with my way of thinking still have a perspective. And it would be valuable for people to know that and to hear it and valuable for me to hear it. So I just listened to what you guys were saying and asked the questions that popped into my head afterwards. So mm-hmm. I wish I I could tell you I, I prepared better for the, than that, but uh, I have found that preparation doesn't seem to make the podcast any better. So absolutely, <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you think you'll ever do something like this, podcast wise? Yeah, like find a way to reach more people because I can tell you something that may or may not help you, and I'll yeah. leave you guys alone after that. Um. I would say I started writing a blog in 2007 and I would get a note a month about how helpful the blog was, but the podcast is seven plus years old now has over 500 episodes and I get probably six to 10 a day now. And so there's a way if you're thoughtful enough with your message and you're relatable enough, which it sounds like you obviously are, if it helps someone, they'll tell someone else about it. Yeah, And it really does have the ability, at least, if it's done well, and I don't know that you're completely in charge of it being done well, meaning that either your thing works for people or it doesn't. You can't mm-hmm. like you can't take a piece of paper and write down the 20 things that are going to make this podcast work. You know what I mean? Right. Um, if you're that person and you believe you are uh, and you're willing to put time and effort into it, it really will reach more people than you can imagine. And they have an amazing ability to take information and help themselves, an ability that I think most people don't believe exists. Um, People can help themselves if they have the right ideas, the right tools. Yeah. So I can I can tell you what what microphone I would get if I was you, if you're ever interested. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, Thank you. No, of course. But it sounds like you're doing amazing things for people. That's really generous. And um, yeah, I I, I think it's uh, it's. If you send me guys uh, details, I'll I'll stitch them into the bumpers of the show too, so okay. people can find you. Awesome. Seriously, so I'm not missing anything. You guys feel good about this? I would say, well, um, Shira's website, livingproofmn.com. My website, diabetes-ed.org. Um, but I would say one thing that's really important about what you do with the podcast, Scott, um, the fact that you talk about life with no restrictions, no um, man- managing diabetes uh, freely so that there aren't, there aren't things that you can or can't do mm-hmm. and that there's no shame involved, that there's no one way to do diabetes. I think that message is really liberating uh, for any of us with diabetes and, and, and for, for anyone with eating disorder, eating disorders too, that, that, that absolutely applies. Right. Um, you know, I think the the one thing for 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 getting recovered, I think you got I, for me, I white knuckled it for a long time. You know, mm-hmm. I just kind of uh, stopped the binging and held on, but I, that wasn't really winning. That wasn't really winning. Yeah, um, that I, was just putting my life in limbo. I watched my father and, try to quit smoking that way, and it was obvious that was not the. My dad wasn't smoking because of how much he loved cigarettes. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. Uh, it just stuff like that doesn't work. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I, I, for me, it's really just at the core of my personality. I've never really, um, 
I've never worried too much about what other people thought. And I can't take credit for that. Honestly, it just, you know, it's how I grew up or something that happened to me growing up where I just always imagined that I had a good answer. And if I didn't have one, the only answer available to me didn't mean it was the only answer that was available. So I would kind of pick around and look for other ideas in other places. And I actually think it has a lot to do with being adopted, Shira. So my, I love my family, um, but it became obvious to me in my early teens that I maybe was thinking on a different level than they were. And I didn't want to hear ideas that I was like, no, I don't think that's right. You, you know, and then and I'd hear that. And instead of going with it, I'd be like, well, what do I think is right? Mm-hmm. And then you start seeing a couple of things go right. And you're like, huh, when I think something's right, it works out. Or at least mm-hmm. it feels like it works out. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And then you got to get over the idea of does it just feel like it works out because it jives with how I feel. Mm-hmm. And then you yeah. start looking at other people. And what I would do is I'd look at other adults in my life. And I would find the best aspects of them. Mm. And I'd be like, that's a really valuable way that this guy thinks about this thing. Or I like the way this woman cares about these people. And I would just sort of like not mirror, well, not steal from them, but I'd keep it as a consideration in my head that that felt like a good idea. And then if I started doing it, then I thought, okay, well, this is good. This is a good way to live. Like nobody really taught me how to live. Like I'll figure it out on my own. But I never once thought, and it, and it led to a lot of uncomfortable moments in my life. Like there were times where I'd say no to things that other people were like, you can't say no to that. I was like, sure I can. But, <laughs> you, you know, like, of course I can. I don't have to do anything. My my poor brother had somebody invited to his wedding recently by my mom, and he ran out of seats. And I was like, tell mom you can't bring those people. And he's like, I can't do that. I was like, why not? <laughs> so I said, it's your wedding. And and so I'm not, but but as Callous as that sounds, and I think Casey, you know this from listening. Like I am not a callous person. Like I, I, I care deeply about people I don't even know for reasons I don't even completely understand. Uh, (laughs) But there's still a line that I can draw between what's right for me and what's not, and I'm not willing to go on the other side of that line. I think a lot of life is much simpler than it appears to people. I think you're immensely practical. Yes. Sort of like, Probably. Cut through the bullshit. So yeah. take take the best and leave the rest, you know. But yeah. I'm also incredibly hopeful. Although yeah. although my my immediate family wouldn't think that because I'm a no person too, sure. If you ask me about something, I start at no and work my way backwards to why we maybe should do it. But <laughs> but if you said to me like, "You know what we should do? Let's go here for vacation." I'd be like, "Hmm. No." And then I might get to yes, but I never leap forward yelling, oh, my God, what a great idea, because it feels like the pertinent decisions that need to be made hadn't been thought through yet. Mm. I don't I have no idea why any of this is true, Um, but I do know that I feel in control of what I do as best as any human being can be. I mean, I realize there are things outside of my control happening to me constantly, but the things that I am able to impact, I just try to constantly impact them in a way that's positive for me for my family and then for people outside of my family it just seems obvious to me, but I don't know. Um, I could be completely wrong by the way. You know, I just know that it, it seems to be working out. So I'm riding that. All right. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on and doing this. I really do. Um, Thank you so much for what you do too. No, no, sure. It was re- really nice to add your voice to this. And I'm um, um, Casey, if you can hold on one second longer, sure. I'd like to say goodbye to you. Too. Sure, sure. sure take Bye, care. guys. Thank day. you, Scott. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You too. Thank you, Sherry. Bye. Thank you, Casey. Well, that was great. I appreciate you adding her to this. I'm glad. I, I thought it was really important to have her longer term perspective. And I, because for me, she's my proof that it's possible. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think I, you know, I truly believe that recovery is, uh, is, I'm I'm living it, and and a long term recovery is in my reach. You know. Yeah. Um, I, was, I think that's I think that's true for everyone who who really desires it and is willing to work for it. I think at the very least, you, that should be your goal. You, you know, it, it just I don't understand shooting halfway. Yeah. Like, you know, oh, I absolutely right. Yeah. Like yeah, go go right. go for the end and and see what happens. Well, I uh, I again I can't thank you enough for doing this. Um, I'm so glad. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for having me. It's been a, a real pleasure, and I, I, I knew it was going to be great. So I'm, I'm great to spend some time with you. Well, I'm glad I did not let you down.
I'm going to thank the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter for sponsoring this episode of the Juice Box Podcast. Also, I want to let you know that Casey gave you a website for Shira a moment ago, but that website has been updated. I'll give you all that information in just a moment. Check out the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter today at contournext.com forward slash juice box. Get yourself an accurate, reliable, easy to use blood glucose meter. There are links in the show notes and at juiceboxpodcast.com. If you can't remember, contournext.com forward slash juice box. I have a note here from Casey, and he says first that Shira renamed her organization Beyond Rules Recovery, and you can find her at beyondrulesrecovery.org. He also adds a little note here to say that he's happily, solidly still in recovery and committed to it, has not had any relapses, and is doing well. So there's a little check-in for Casey and uh, an update for that website, beyondrulesrecovery.org. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Juice Box Podcast. Check out juiceboxpodcast.com because there you'll find a lot more in the After Dark series. You can also find them right there in your podcast player. Just look for Juice Box Podcast After Dark. If you're looking for community around type 1 diabetes, look no farther than the Juice Box Podcast private Facebook group. Over 21,000 members now. Juice Box Podcast Type 1 Diabetes. And if you're looking to support type 1 diabetes research, just go to t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. It'll take you fewer than 10 minutes to fill out the absolutely easy to do survey. It's HIPAA compliant, absolutely anonymous. Again, will take you less than 10 minutes. When you fill it out, your answers will be helping other people with type 1 diabetes. It's very simple to do. t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. Thanks again for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. And if my friend's still listening, the one I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I hope this was great for you. I hope you enjoyed this episode and it left you feeling empowered and capable because Casey did it and I think anybody could. And so to that person and anyone out there who may be struggling with an eating disorder, I want to implore you not to give up, to keep looking for your Shira, your way out, I think you can do it, and I hope this helped.